Welcome into Other People's Shoes, the podcast where listeners get to step into the lives of others and see the world through their shoes. Your host, Neil Matthews, is a seasoned interviewer who has a natural talent for empathizing with his guests and drawing out their unique perspectives. Through a combination of storytelling and insightful questioning, Other People's Shoes explores the lives of a diverse range of guests, from everyday people to celebrities and thought leaders. With a warm and welcoming style, Neil creates a safe and supportive space for his guests to share their stories, while also challenging listeners to broaden their perspective and think more deeply about the world around them. So tune in to Other People's Shoes with Neil Matthews and get ready to step into other people's shoes. Hey, we'll take a walk. Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for hitting play today. Speaking of things that I've been playing lately, anybody hear that Tennessee Orange song? Anyone out there? I don't even know the artist's name, but it is such a catchy little gem, and I find myself kind of weeping over it, only because I really hope one day Adia, my daughter, as you all know her, you've heard of her, you've never heard her, but you've heard of her, I hope she never calls me one day and says, Dad, I'm wearing Duke Blue for him today. Because if that happens, I don't know what my world would do. Now, I know for some of you, you're like, it's just a color. It's just a school. But there is something about when you wear the rival's colors (laughs) that I think invokes so much. What does that have to do with anything today? Well, I don't know. It just was on my mind and I wanted to share that. What would you help me welcome in my new friend, Rodney? Rodney, help us with that, would you? Yes. That's so great to be with you, Neil. Thank you so much for having me. You know, you say, do we bleed orange here in Tennessee? Well, yes, all of my neighbors bleed orange here in Tennessee. Not me. I'm not a huge Tennessee fan. I hate to say I'm not a huge college football fan. I hope that didn't turn anybody off. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much. I, I look forward to it. Well, then I feel like we could at least audition you or maybe petition you basketball season as we kind of kick end of November off. Like we're going to be right at tournament time before we know it. So could you, would you, would you consider wearing light blue for us? Yes, absolutely. I will wear your colors. Just if you'll send me an email anytime they're playing, I, I'll wear it. I'll sport it. I'm in. Get some social media posts like <laughs> Look at me, I'm a Tar Heel fan now. <laughs> Well, I try I'm wearing every the week. Tar Heel color anyway. <laughs> I try every week to get a Tar Heel fan. We need more fandom somewhere. We do, though. Now, I hear that you have a tattoo. You're that serious. I am that serious. Oh, yeah. no. It's, yes, it's true. It is true. Yeah. Mm. Everything in my life. I mean, outside of Jesus. Well, I think the order should go Jesus, my wife, North Carolina. <laughs> Sometimes those get flippy flopped around. On to you, my friend. I love to lead off every show with this question, and that's this. Rodney, what size shoes do you wear? Okay, it's a 10 and a half wide. Okay, double E. Like my foot is so wide. I'm the flattest footed guy on the planet. I'm a short foot, 10 and a half, a double E, sometimes a triple E, a patent leather shoe. I'm pretty wide. That's sad. My friend down in Texas, Sean McCoy, he says he he didn't even know people had arches. He said when he got in the Navy, all of his friends teased him. He said, your feet are just tired. They're just so flat. They're tired. And you'd think, you know, having a wide foot like that, I'd be able to swim circles around everybody. But my bones are so big, I sink like a rock. <laughs> What's that rock that doesn't sink? What is that? Pumice or something? Isn't that the one that doesn't sink? Yeah, no, no, I should have paid not. attention in science more. That yes, would've, yes, That would have been helpful in this moment. All right. Well, you mentioned the patent leather shoes. Is that the style of shoe you love to wear? Or is there a different style or a brand maybe that you love more than another? No, I love a good tennis shoe. I like to wear tennis shoe most of the time. Flip flops, obviously, here on the lake. Flip flops have to be there. You got to get them off easy. Dress shoe, I like a soft leather shoe. I hate a patent leather shoe. Sometimes you have to do it. The nature of the business. Well, people love Cole Hans. Have you looked into those at all? Uh, yeah, my, they have a hard time. My foot doesn't go in a cold. <laughs> on very well. Johnson Murphy. I tend to lean into a Johnson Murphy. They do a good job on wide feet. All right. There we go. All right. Johnson Murphy. All right. 
Haven't heard that name dropped in a few times. Well, Rodney, help us with this. We've been sitting around and we're kind of in our home stretch time, believe it or not. We're like five episodes away from being done with this season. It's been so exciting to hear people's take, people's view, people's interpretation of this phrase. And the phrase is your only. So when you hear that, what does that invoke in you? Mm, your only. Can you give me an example? Like your only. How does that invoke something? That's the best part is I want you to really wrestle with that. If somebody said to you, Rodney, you're only ever going to be or Rodney, you are this. You're only this. Yeah, that's great. That's a great sparker. I, the first thing that comes to my mind when you go a little deeper there is my father. My father always told me I'd never grow up to be anything. I was a heavy kid, a little lazy. I didn't like to go out and help him clean the garage when he wanted to clean the garage or whatever. And anytime I spent time with my dad, it seemed to be cleaning the garage or something like that. So I would say that the deepest thing that it would invoke in me is my father telling me that I'd never grow up to be anything. And at some level, he would tell me, I'm going to grow up and be just like X. He would name somebody to paint a picture. What did that do for you psychologically, do you feel like? Oh my gosh, we all desire our father's blessing. I grew up in a household. I never heard my father say that he loved me. I never saw affection in the home. My mother and dad were married 62 years. I never saw him hug her. I never saw him kiss her. He never gave her an anniversary card, flowers. It wasn't until I was an older man, actually 2001, I'd moved to Arizona, that I actually knew my dad's life story. I can still remember sitting at my father's feet and weeping and asking his forgiveness for the expectations I had of him that he didn't have the capacity to give me. That was a transformational moment for me with my relationship with my dad. But I never knew my dad's life story. He was orphaned at 12, 2001, one of my 37, 38 years old. And I never knew that about my father. Why do you think he kept everything hidden? It was probably pretty painful for him. I think that he really didn't know how to talk about it. He wasn't an intimate man. I think he was afraid of intimacy. And I think he was afraid to, to have a real conversation. He was a salesman all of his life. And then he ran a Freightliner dealership and managed that for years, primarily in sales. I think he was a pretty close man and held up a pretty strong persona about who he was. He was uneducated. I mean, he had an eighth grade education, but was very successful in life. Any of those conversations would drag him backwards, reveal things that he didn't want revealed in his spheres of influence. I have a similar experience. My dad spent 20 some odd years in the Marine Corps and was gone all the time. And when he mm -hmm. was home, I've always said he wasn't really home. He was mm -hmm. he was there, wherever there right. was. And I don't understand that. I've never been a Marine. Marines I've talked to, I've asked them that question. I said, hey, when you were home, were you home? And they said, no, we were usually mentally there, wherever there was again. That was hard too, growing up, realizing mm -hmm. and, and never really hearing mm -hmm. the, the I love yous, the I'm proud of yous, let's go have a catch. One of the worst movies ever made, I think was Field of Dreams. Joking, of course, I love it. Right. Hardest moment moments in that movie for me is when the main character, Kevin Costner, Ray, goes to play catch with his dad and they have this amazing, and it's always at the end of the movie and this rolling, amazing music comes and all this stuff just gets me there. I mean, did you ever dream of that moment, like where your dad and you would just have this moment? Maybe it wasn't catch, maybe it was something else. And if so, maybe speak to that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Especially as I became a believer, went through a transformational experience, started pressing into power of relational capital in the work that we do today is all about relationship and relational capital. To not have a relationship with your dad or an intimate relationship with your dad was a deep hole for me, a longing hole for me. I lost lost my brother at the age of 27. I was 25. My only sibling lost him to cancer. I think that even created a bigger hole. My dad and I would find ourselves on the end of a telephone. I would always tell him that I love him. He would never reciprocate. He would weep and groan with these deep groans. And he would ask me, he would say, do you think that your brother knew that I loved him? He could ask that question. And it was just broke his heart. It was deep within him. He couldn't say it, even though he had that kind of regret. On that trip, trip in 2001 when my father took me around and showed me where he was. I grew up in Waco, Texas. And so we were over on Baylor campus. He was telling me his life story and that he was orphaned at the age of 12 and so on and so forth. I'm weeping at his feet, asking for his forgiveness, which I've already stated. For us to embrace and hug and to feel the embrace of my father and then to kiss him. I don't think that there's very many moments like that we all don't desire as men, especially with our fathers. 
others. And I'm grateful that I had that moment with my dad and my relationship with my dad was very different after that moment. My dad had a level of intimacy that he had never had before. Wow. I have an older brother too. Mm. He's two years older than I am. And for whatever reason, he has chosen, and I'm choosing these words, he has chosen mm. to not only walk away from myself, he's chosen to walk away from my dad, my mom, all of our mm-hmm. immediate family. He's chosen that. Mm-hmm. My dad has said for years since my brother has chosen to walk away. It's been years now, not just been mm-hmm. a couple of months. It's been years, almost a mm-hmm. decade. I, I would, if I probably could pin it back. And in that, my dad has said for, as I get, as I said, for almost a decade now said, I only have one son and it's you. Mm-hmm. He's almost eliminated my brother from his mind, from his memories, from his expectations. And it kills me every time he says that. Now there's kind of this war that's going on with with me, almost like mm-hmm. the white dog and the black dog, that old Asian, you know, mm-hmm. parable. Mm-hmm. Which dog are you going to feed? And the white dog, he wants. <laughs> He wants the appreciation of dad. He wants the catch moment, like I described right. with Kevin Costner mm-hmm. in, in Field of Dreams. He wants that weeping moment with you at Baylor. Mm-hmm. He wants that. He craves mm-hmm. that. Listen, this is everything you've ever wanted. You're the only one. This is the center of attention. Like you finally get to be the the prodigal son. Come home. Mm-hmm. You get to be the elevated one. And it's like this war goes on with, with me and, and him. Now, he doesn't know the war. He doesn't, he's never asked about the war. That's what happened. So, if you were going to be my friend in this moment, (laughs) counsel would you give me in this moment for maybe other guys who have dealt with this on a a deep level? Because these are deep wounds that aren't just easily like flushed out. You went to a men's retreat or I went to this conference and everything's better now. Wow, it's so great. Somebody call Hallmark because I have a great movie for them. I'll say it this way I've been in the relationship business since 1991 and dedicated my life to helping people build empathy and understanding and trust. My oldest daughter walked out of my life and my wife's life about four years ago. I've never met my two grandchildren and I don't know how to fix it. And it hurts me deeply. So I'm not a man that can sit on this side of the mic and tell you how to fix that. But what I can tell you is that everything boils down to the truth or a lie. And the lie is, is that you're better off without your brother in the relationship. The lie is that I'm better off without having to deal with my daughter. All of those are lies. God wants us to have deep, intimate relationships, intimate relationships. He wants us to know him and he wants us to make him known. In order to do that, we need to be known and we need to know the people that we're doing life with. And that requires a level of transparency and honesty. I think about the passage that says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. As we confess our sins one one to another, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. God loves deep relationship and transparent relationships. And so I would say, lean in, pursue your brother. I write my daughter a letter every time the Holy Spirit tells me to. (laughs) And whether she reads it or not, I don't know. (laughs) She doesn't reply to me on her birthday. I'll send her a text or I'll email her. She doesn't reply to me. That's okay for this season. And I'm believing that God is going to turn that and he's going to not only restore the years that the locusts have eaten away, he's going to give my daughter and I many fold back in return in our relationships. And that might be the day I'm on my deathbed, Lord forbid, (laughs) or it could be today. I'm praying for today. (laughs) And I would encourage you to do the same with your brother. Encourage you to, in a gentle spirit, encourage your dad to do the same. I think that's the hardest part because no one knows where he is. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not like he's down on 123 Main Street. Right. That's the hard part. I have said for years, I haven't changed my number. It seems like nowadays nobody really does that anymore. There used to Mm -hmm. be, I feel like, a trend where we were changing our numbers all the time. Yeah, right. Now I feel like that's kind of dissipated and and gone away and nobody really does that anymore. Unless you're trying to hide from somebody. Used to work in collections. So that would be Mm -hmm. the time I would see people change their numbers. Outside of that, my number hasn't changed. You know, I look forward to the day that my phone rings, Mm -hmm, random number that I don't know, (laughs) <laughs> and I answer it, you know, thinking it's my Apple ID has been compromised. Caller. The IRS is after me. Or, <laughs> but in that, I imagine yeah. it being my brother on the other end. Yeah. I do. 
Yeah. I don't think it'll and happen. be a sweet moment. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, yeah. two things come to mind. First off, thank you for sharing what you shared with your daughter mm-hmm. and being mm-hmm. transparent on that. So I want to acknowledge that. But two things came to mind out of that for me. One, you said you're kind of in the business of building empathy. Mm-hmm. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. How the heck do you build empathy? Because I've been told and been taught even, so maybe this is an education for me, mm-hmm. that empathy can't be taught. Either you have it or you don't. Mm-hmm. So can it be taught? Can it be a learned skill like underwater absolutely. scuba diving or being a North Carolina fan? That can be taught as well, by the way. Yeah, I, I, no, absolutely. I, I think we're called to a daily pursuit of transformation in Scripture. It's in that daily pursuit of transformation. There are two things that happen. One is there are certain things I think that are true that aren't true. <laughs> and when I discover that, I have to humble myself and be willing to say, I've been wrong <laughs> and I've wronged you. I've looked at you through a certain lens. I've thought certain things about you. I've made certain assumptions about you or or things that are absolutely wrong. And I need to seek your forgiveness. And I need to live life different tomorrow with you than I lived it today. That's empathy. My willingness to live life different with you tomorrow than I lived it today, because now I have understanding that I didn't have before then. And I think about also another example of that would be, I personally believe that what you don't know might be much more important than what you do know. So our daily pursuit should also be about the business of discovering those things that we don't know and saying, is that full of truth? And if it is, how does that change my life? How does that change my my relationship with my daughter? Or how does it change my relationship with you, Neil, or my employee, or with my wife, Elizabeth, or my neighbor, or my friend? I think that's empathy. The business that we're in is about helping people see the areas Areas of their life in which they might be judging others instead of valuing others. If I judge you, there is no empathy. <laughs> if I value you, even if we're in the midst of conflict and misunderstanding, I'm leaning into the relationship. I'm not leaning out of the relationship. That's empathy. Those would be some examples. Describe empathy different than what maybe you've heard it before. Yeah, I do. I think that is a different definition than I've ever heard it before, is the idea of constantly growing in it. And I love the idea of not sitting at a seat of judgment, Mm -hmm. coming at it from a standpoint of, you know, I might be wrong in this area. I might have mislooked at this area before. We had an elder growing up, was a World War II veteran. I think he may have even been at Pearl Harbor. I don't know exactly. He's since passed. So I can't ask him. He said, and his name's Ed, and Ed was this crotchety old German guy. (laughs) How he fought for us, I have no idea. There's a story there, I'm sure, and I never got to hear it, which I'm still mad about to this day. Not angry, mad, bugged that I didn't go and ask. Yeah, it's a hold, right? But in that, Ed would say to me quite often, he said, you know, Neil, I walk into every situation with this mindset, and you need to have this. And I'm like, okay, young pastor, young up and coming, whatever I was back in those days. He said, you walk in, and I'm like, okay, pin ready, pad ready. I'm like, I'm going, because, you know, we didn't have iPhones in those days. It's old I am. He said, walk into every situation with this mindset. I could be wrong. And I might even be wrong. No, Ed, I'm right. And he goes, no, no, no. Hear me, son. He said, walk in thinking I might be wrong. If you walk in saying, you know what? I might be wrong about this person. I might be wrong about this view. I might be wrong about this. That changes your mindset. I'm like, does it though? And I tried it for a month straight. Like every meeting I went into at church, every meeting I went into at work, everything I went into, I was like, okay, I might be wrong in this. I was like, man, Ed might be on to something. So that's what I hear you saying that. You're absolutely right. It's it, do you have an open mindset or a closed mindset? And I think the only way that you can have empathy, a transformation such as that, where we can actually see someone different or live with someone different, cannot be done out of our flesh. The flesh is all, always leads to death. Only thing that's in us that has the ability to bring life into our relationships is the spirit of the living God. And it is that spirit that is within us that gives us the power to empathize with someone else, the power to admit when we're wrong, the power to seek forgiveness and grant forgiveness. And I think that's where true empathy comes from. We've used the word very loosely over the years, I believe, and we say that we have empathy, but very few of us really do have empathy. At the core of empathy, I think, is humility, the the ability to admit and be open and say that I absolutely might not be wrong. I'll give you another example with Elizabeth Ann, my wife. I was 18. 
She was 22. She was dental assistant. She already been to college, graduated college. I'm just graduating high school. I take her to the county courthouse and I marry her in less than 15 minutes on a Thursday afternoon. 1984, February 6th. This year, we'll celebrate our 40th anniversary only by the grace of God. The way I actually got into the relational capital business, building strong teams and building strong relationships is an exposure I had to a Sunday school teacher. Now, Elizabeth and I were going to church. We look good. We smell good. But what was happening behind doors it was terrible. I'm telling you, first seven years of our marriage was hell. I don't know any other category to put it in. I set off on a journey to change her. She set off on a journey to change me. We were night and day. They had told me that I would never grow up to be anything. I was pursuing everybody's approval. Everybody was more important than her. I'll get back to the story. Played golf with this Sunday school teacher that was a young young adult, Sunday school teacher, play golf with him every Saturday morning. And one Saturday morning, he says, hey, seems like you and Elizabeth might be struggling a little bit. Would you like some help? Humble myself enough to say, sure, why not? We set a dinner and he set us down at a table and he handed us two pieces of paper, took about 10 minutes to complete. And after completing that little 10 minute exercise, he walks back to the back of his room, his wife and us, we kibitz a little bit. And he comes back and he's got these two reports that are about 20 pages long, sets them in front of us, turns to the first page, and it's a graphic. These graphics are opposite. I mean, absolute opposite. And I looked at those graphics and I said, no wonder, boy, what a mistake have we made. He looked back across that table, Neil, and he said, isn't God good? And he spent the next hour unpacking scripture and revealing God's divine design for our differences. That was an absolute transformational moment. Elizabeth Ann is a suitable helper. Well, why is she suitable? Because she has what I don't have. And you know what? I have what she doesn't have. And when those two things lean into each other, we have more. That was a transformational experience. I was a regional manager for Snap-on Tools Corporation at that time. I resigned that job three to six months later, and I went to work for that man. And I've been on the journey helping people understand God's divine design for our differences ever since. I work primarily with pastors and their teams, husbands and wives, under several different brands. That was a transformational moment. I think empathy was at the core of that, the ability to actually start seeing through Elizabeth's eyes. So an example would be Elizabeth. I'm a dreamer. So in our marriage, I'd come to Elizabeth and I'd say, honey, I got the best idea I spread. What do you hear it, baby? I'm telling you, you're going to love it. And boy, my optimism is just welling up. She's a realist. She's on the opposite end of that continuum. So when I say, honey, I got the best idea since sliced bread, what do you think she's thinking? Oh my gosh, here we go again. Jack (laughs) has come home with the beans. Where's the cow? And I would get fed up dreaming. She would ask me those two or three questions that would blow a hole right in my idea. And Lord forbid we were out to dinner with someone else and I'm dreaming with another couple with her and she's blowing holes in my ideas. And I'm going like, this woman isn't for me. She's not for me. She's never going to be for me. She's against me. She is the party pooper, dude. And once again, transformational moment that evening when I could see she was not saying she's not for me. She's simply asking, have I thought about this? When I could start seeing through that lens and go, wait a minute, she can see things I can't see. She can see obstacles standing in the way of my dream that my optimism just says, oh, we don't have to worry about those. That would actually stand in the way of the success of that dream, that was a transformational moment. That's empathy, in my opinion, is when we can see that into the mirror in a way as if we didn't see it and actually live life different tomorrow with a person than we lived the day before. Um, Rodney, I need to confess something to you. I, I don't often share this, but I, I think it's a it's an appropriate moment. Mm. I've been married 22 years mm. to Elizabeth Ann. Uh. Not your Elizabeth Ann, but my (laughs) Elizabeth Elizabeth Ann. Ann. Correct. Yes, sir. As you're describing your marriage, as you're describing your relationship, Mm -hmm. it sounds eerily similar similar. to mine. (laughs) Right. I'm going to start this podcast, baby. You're going to love it. Man, that is us in a nutshell. 
I'm mm-hmm. the dreamer. She's the realist. I'm yeah. the, the free spirit, I think Dave Ramsey calls it. She's the nerd. Yeah. I'm all these things. Babe, listen, I think I'm going to go be a landscaper. And she's like, <laughs> you hate cutting grass. No, that's not you. No, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to make this much money and it's going to be amazing. Two months in, I'm like, God, this sucks. Why did I pick this <laughs> job? <laughs> And then she says, I could have told you so. I had seven (laughs) jobs in one year. Seven jobs in one year. Embarrassingly admitting that. Our work is all about how do we help people see God's word as the foundational truth that we can stand on. And he means only prosperity for us, especially in our relationships, not calamity. So where's the calamity coming from? Where's the discord coming from? He wants oneness and unity in our relationships. So where's it coming from? And then I'm ashamed to say, and it sounds like you might be in the same boat. I stopped dreaming with Elizabeth. I just simply didn't share certain things with her anymore. I couldn't handle that rejection when it wasn't rejection at all. I just didn't have the empathy, the ability, or the understanding to see through her lens, to walk in her shoes. When we can make that tangible, we can see what God's Word says about it. Now in eight to 10 minutes, we can take a snapshot and we can now have something physical and tangible and objective that we can hold on to that can drive a purposeful discussion. Kind of third leg of our stool is purposeful discussion. We can actually grow our empathy for one another. I can actually walk in your shoes. I can actually understand what it looks like to walk in your shoes. I can start understanding how you think and never make assumptions anymore about what you're thinking and always drive that deeper level of conversation. And I pray the same for you and Elizabeth Ann. I believe that in our marriage every day, we should be growing a deeper love and a deeper intimacy with our with our spouse, with our Elizabeth Ann's. Satan wants to make sure that all we're finding is more distance in our relationship, more isolation in our relationship, more doing it on our own versus with each other. That's the scheme. And that's the scheme in every relationship. He wants to make sure my daughter and I can never empathize with each other. I'll never be able to walk in her. She, I'll never be able to understand her pain. And I'll never be able to truly ask and seek her forgiveness. All she'll receive from me is continued judgment. You know, that old dad that, you know, 35 years ago, you know, took her home from the hospital, right? Not the, not the, do, the new dad that grows every day. Um, in in wisdom and understanding and wants more than anything to have a deep, intimate relationship with her. I heard it said years ago at a youth conference, this speaker came and, and shared with us. He said, you know, Satan Satan's going out of business. I don't know if you guys know this young people, but he's going out of business. And I'm like, I'm like what the heck? What, where are you going with this? Right. And he said, no, hear me out. He's going out of business, so he's selling all of his stuff, selling all of his, you know, schemes and all of this uh-huh. other stuff. He's going out of business. And I'm like... Okay, seriously, get your point here. And he goes, but there's one thing he's not selling. See, he won't sell this widget. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. what? He's like, he's not going to sell this widget called a wedge. And I'm like, what? I, I don't understand. He said, that's the thing he won't ever get rid of. He might get rid of everything else, but he's never going to get rid of this wedge because this wedge is, is going to divide you with. He's going to bring it. it in. He's going to put that wedge in between you and God. He's going to put that wedge in between you and your dad, you and whoever. Yep. That's the one element that he will never get rid of. Yep. And I was like, I don't like that, <laughs> but it's so true. And I think that's the problem that I see right now in a lot of relationships and a lot of marriages mm-hmm. and a lot of friendships and a lot of church relationships and a lot of businesses is this wedge gets divided in between people and then it separates That's good. Them. That's real good. And if you think about it that wedge, the wedge is the enemy, not you. The problem isn't you. The problem is the wedge. The problem is the lies that we bought about each other, the misunderstandings, the assumptions. I love the you assumption. Uh, so do you know what the definition of assumption is? I don't. In some circles, it's, it makes an ass out of me and you both. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, I did yeah, hear that, that, that one. Yeah. So I'll give you one that we can use in, in church circle. And that is that assumption is the lowest form of knowledge, but yet we treat it as what? The gospel. We treat it as the truth. Anytime you assume something about someone, one else. It could be the truth or it could be a lie. It could be the wedge or it could be the spirit. What we want to make sure is, is that if we assume something, we always ask for clarification to make sure our assumptions are true. And if they're true, then that's the rock. We can stand on that and we can build on that, even though we might not like it. Now we understand it for what it is and we can navigate that water. The wedge being all about lies, lies are one lie leads to another lie leads to another lie. It's hard to pin those down. It's a great conversation, Neil. I hope it's encouraging to your listeners. 
listeners, and I know there's a lot of hurting people out there, and I like to say it this way, it is 100% impossible for you to heal a relationship if you're hiding. Can't do it. You have to come into the light. You have to be willing to step in and engage and be willing to journey with each other, even through the pain. You cannot get healed if you hide. It's not possible. It is not of God. I love that a lot. I was actually going to make a, a metaphor back to golf because I've been uh-huh. playing a lot of golf lately with my wife. Okay. And the wedge itself, when I pull it out of my bag, is always dangerous. Like I can mm. never swing <laughs> it right. I can never get the right, the loft. I can't, uh-huh. I'm not there yet. However, yep. years ago, I found on a golf course, actually, a chipper that looks like a putter. And okay. man, I can swing that just right. And I think sometimes I have to chip away rather than using the wedge. Yep. I'd rather yep. chip away than use the wedge in my life. Because chipping mm-hmm. seems a little easier. I can swing that a little easier. Yeah, the flatter the blade, the easier. It seems to be less painful when I chip rather than use the wedge. I don't know how that works. Two verses come to mind that I wanted to share with you and get your thoughts okay. on. The, the first one comes to mind, and I know you Bible scholar, maybe you are, maybe you're not. I would love to get your thoughts on these. First mm-hmm. one is this. It's found in First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. It says, To this you were called, because Christ... I suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Mm -hmm. I would say that at the core of that is love. There's no greater love than a man give himself for another. We also know that the greatest among you shall be called your what? Slave, your servant. When I hear that passage, I think about my good friend, Dr. Dale Tackett. Dr. Dale Tackett did the Truth Project, and now he's done his next called the Encounter Project. He deals with the word love. I want to give you a definition that is his definition, it's not mine. And I think it's one of the most powerful definitions of love I've ever heard. He says that love is the zealous, selfless seeking of another's true good. Love is the zealous, selfless seeking of another's true good. I think that the passage that you just read in 1 Peter exemplifies that kind of love, the zealous and this selfless seeking of another's true good. Yeah, I agree. It's always been one of my favorites, especially since we're kind of around shoes in this Mm -hmm. realm of Mm -hmm. thinking, trying to be in other people's shoes. And so to me, following in someone's footsteps, you're in their shoes. That's it. Years ago, I changed my signature to in his sandals at the end of my Mm -hmm. emails. My old executive producer, Garrett, really had a problem with that. He really struggled with that. He goes, that seems very pompous, very arrogant. You're in his (laughs) sandals. And I said, Mm -hmm. listen, I want to be in his sandals every day. I want to walk in his footsteps every day. I want to be in his shoes. Mm Because if I'm in his shoes, or in this case, in his sandals, I should be walking the way he walked. I should be talking the way he talked. I should be loving the way he loved. The other one that comes to mind as we talk about, you know, getting validation from others and seeking people's approval. Sounds like you've struggled with that. I know I have, and I think others have as well. Comes Mm -hmm. out of Galatians chapter one, verse 10. It says, obviously, Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. Mm -hmm. If I'm Mm -hmm. pleasing people were my goal, I would not be a servant of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think about the parallel passage of that is everything that we do, we do it as unto the Lord. If we labor, we labor in vain. If If we do that for ourselves, this whole zealous selflessness towards others is even at the core of this passage. You know, for me, I think that there's no greater place to be than to to out love, out serve, to do that out of the ground gratitude in my heart to do that out of what Christ has done for me and the love that I want to give to someone else, the love that lives within me, not out of winning approval, not out of trying to win God's favor. I've already won God's favor. He sent his son to the cross for me. There's no greater favor than that. (laughs) I don't need other people's favor. I do want to be at peace with men and I want to be loving on people and I want to be serving people. I'm a servant at heart. I want them to experience the love of God through me with the focal point not being on me. I think about in 1 Peter 4.10, where it talks about how we faithfully administrate God's grace. Well, how do we faithfully administrate God's grace? Well, we do that with the various gifts in which he's given us as we give them away to each other. Firmly believe that everything that God has given you, Neil, he's given you to give away to someone else. (laughs) I love the first line of Rick Warren's book. It's not about you. (laughs) It's not. It requires you. Think that everything that God's given us, he's given us to give away, not for accolade, not 
not for approval, but in order to bring him glory and to faithfully administrate his grace in its various forms. I love that too. The idea of giving it away. Mm -hmm. I do. I like that a lot. Paul says it's your spiritual act of worship. He said it's your true act of worship, offering your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's hard to do because it takes selflessness and and humility. Yeah. And I think that's why I love golf so much is it takes humility (laughs) to, to admit that you need help. It takes humility to admit you've done something wrong. Yeah, yeah, right. The less I play, the better I play, if that makes sense. (laughs) I just need more mulligans in my life. That's what I keep telling myself. If someone's hearing you right now and they're curious about how you can maybe help their business, their relationships, igniting, that's a good word, igniting in them after you're speaking here, what's the best way someone can connect with you and what you're doing? Uh, Yeah, just go to strongteams.com. Strongteams.com will get you there. You can see what we offer and what our processes are and things things of that nature. And considering how we're in the season of Thanksgiving and Christmas, I would even offer a coupon to anyone that that wants to be our guest and maybe make tangible some of the things that we've talked about here today. And that coupon would be Simply Shoes. If you want to engage us and, and go through any of our processes when you're in the shopping cart, just apply the coupon Shoes and we'll give you a 20% discount. So we can offer that up to your audience. Our heart, um, we are business tree. If you know, if you've ever heard that term, Neil. Have you ever heard the term business tree? I have not. This is the first. So when I formed Ministry Insight and StrongTeams.com back in 2001, I could either be a nonprofit or a for-profit. I had a process and I had some tools and things in which I felt like were inexpensive and that we could offer to the church, we could offer to the believer, and that it would actually fund the ministry. So we have a ministry mindset, but a business model. And so I think your guests will find if they go out and they visit our site, there's a lot of free stuff there, but if they want to engage. We keep things very inexpensive. We keep things to keep our doors open and keep our ministry running without having to go out and to raise money to do that. And once again, that coupon shoes would love to offer up. That's awesome. I, we appreciate that tremendously. Mm-hmm. Well, Rodney, again, is as we start to close, I want to center back around you and what you're about. I love to ask this question too. It's one of my favorites. If somehow we could time travel in that DeLorean, you can have the one from the first version of Back to the Future, the one that actually drove, or you can have the flying (laughs) one, your choice. I don't care. But it was the same type of car. But if we were to time travel back to when you were eight years old, Mm -hmm. that eight-year-old little boy, and you could go back in time and tell him one thing about right now, what would you tell him? I would tell Rodney is that Jesus loves you. This I know for the Bible tells me so. I would stand on that. I grew up in the church. I would stand on that simple but profound truth, not seek people's approval, not try and chase things in order to find my significance and to just be who God created me to be, to give that away to everybody that I encounter and for that to be enough. Do you think that eight-year-old you would believe any of that? Well, if I could time travel back and I'm carrying what I know now that I didn't know then back to that day and time, yes. If I was going back to that eight-year-old boy and I didn't have that and I was just in the eight-year-old boy's shoes without the life journey, I would say it would have a lot of dependence on my dad and other people that were in my life that were communicating to me, I would never be anything. I think the power of words in the tongue has the ability to bless or to curse. Our tongue is powerful. What you say to your daughter is very important. I I think about my three grandchildren here that we're close to every time they come over. The first thing I do is I grab my little arrow's face and I look her in the eyes and I say, guess what? And she goes, I'm pretty. I said, that's right, baby. And then I'll go to my grandson and I'll look Merrick Liam in the eye. He's next. And they're all smiling, standing in line. Then I grab his face and I say, guess what? <laughs> and he says, I'm handsome. I said, that's right, son. And then I go to little, <laughs> little Heidi Maeve. She's two and a half. She's smiling bigger than Dallas. She knows what's coming. I grab her little face and I look her square in the eyes and I say, guess what? And she says, I'm pretty. I said, 
That's right. <laughs> and then we all hug and we run and we jump and we play. But it's the first words that I speak into the hearts of my grandchildren. And I think a lot of that is bore out of the pain of not ever hearing that from my father. I think it's an amazing question, Neil. I think the people in our lives, especially those that influence us, have a great deal to do with the beginnings of our life and, and how we journey. See, I envision you going back in time, grabbing yourself, eight-year-old mm-hmm. you, mm-hmm. by the face, as you're describing yep. as your grandchildren, mm-hmm. and looking Amen. you eye to eye, which is weird. I know mm-hmm. if you time travel, all the movies tell us, don't go see yourself, which is silly. Yeah. But I envision you going back in time, grabbing yourself by the face, little eight-year-old you, and looking you in the eye, Rodney to Rodney, mm-hmm. and saying, listen, son, you're handsome, and you're mm-hmm. destined for amazing right. things. Amen. That's what I Amen. envision. Amen. And I well, think that I'll little boy maybe that. weeps. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he wasn't a crier. Maybe he learned right. that crying was weakness. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think in his heart of hearts, he probably wanted to hear that. Just Yeah, amen. 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 Well, Rodney, again, thank you so much for being here today. Before we let you go, though, we have to do some silliness. We, we've had some very... I think heartfelt things. I think we need mm-hmm. a little giggles. You seem mm-hmm. like a, a guy that likes to giggle. Yep. I, I have one or two in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Well, we do this thing at the end of the show called senseless. It's these six random questions okay. that are just silly. They're just nonsensical. I don't know if okay. that's a word, but I made it up and I'm using it. Yeah. Nonsensical. Okay. So anyway, so I couldn't get a Tennessee Volunteers cup or even a Tennessee Titans cup, but it is it is light blue. I mean, did you yeah. see the cup? Did you notice? Yeah, the cup? I see it. Yes. All right. All right. You can drink from this cup too uh-huh. if you want. It's a North uh-huh. Carolina cup. You can. Yes, so. uh-huh. Anyway, there's a die in here, as you see. So we're going to roll uh-huh. this up just to make it random. So you okay. know somebody doesn't think we've selected your question ahead of time. That's why we do the okay. die. So I'm going to roll for you. And you got number two. Okay. Two, number two, two. two. And it's a light blue two at that. Uh huh. It's a North Carolina die. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two people you want to hug. Two people I want to hug. I want to hug my oldest daughter, Ashley Elizabeth, and I want to hug my grandchildren that I've not met before. That was easy. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was going to be more challenging and difficult for you. No, like no, some no. people struggle with that. You're like, no, nope, they're pretty they high on my mind right now, Neil. They're, you've done a good job of pulling that out there uh, today, which I, I deeply appreciate. Well, that's awesome. Well, again, Rodney, just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate mm-hmm. you giving us some moments today and some insight into what you're about and, of course, how you can help folks. So just want to say thank you for that. Hey, you bet. And listen, if you really want to be silly, when I saw the number two, do you want me to tell you what really came across my mind? Please. The Porta John that <laughs> comes across the front of my deal here and services my Porta Potty. I'm under construction in this house. It says we're number one in the number two business. <laughs> That's fantastic. We're number one in the number two business. That's that's fantastic. That's great marketing right there. I think it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. But again, Rodney, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate that. Thanks, Neil, for having us. We're grateful. Well, guys and gals, kids and campers alike, that is it. That is all. That is our show today. So what's your takeaway? Can you really build into empathy? Now, let me tell you, when I think of building, I think of Lincoln Logs. I think of Legos. I think of Tinker Toys. I'm dating myself. I was terrible at all of those things. In fact, I I think you guys know this. I I work at a body shop and I have now for almost a year now. And I see guys all the time taking apart cars, the damages of a car accident. And I see them putting it back together again. So how does that relate to you? Well, here's how. What in your life is so damaged, is so broken, is so in disarray? And you think there's no way that can be put back together again. In the auto business, it's called a total loss. In other words, the car car is beyond repair. It can't be fixed. Have you ever thought to yourself, I'm just a total loss. Nobody wants me. I'm going to be just sent away to the scrapyard, sold at auction, given away. Hmm. If that's you today, can you just let me know? I'd, I'd love to know what you think on that. You can let us know at OPSpodcast.com. You can also let us know on our socials at OPS Podcast Show under Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'd be curious to know. And as we get out of here, don't forget, don't ever forget. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. I want to say thank you again for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.